Welcome to the Arlington Street Church podcast. Founded in 1729, Arlington Street continues today as a gathering place for progressive people of faith in the greater Boston area and beyond. We are located at the corner of Arlington and Boylston Streets, across from the Public Garden in Boston, Massachusetts. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace. Just after the turn of the new year, several of you told me about an app I should really get for my phone. It's called We Croak. Available in the App Store for 99 cents, it promises to remind us at random times, five times a day, that we're going to die. With one exception, in every group in which this was discussed, there was a mix of curiosity and horror, mostly horror. The exception was a large gathering of Unitarian Universalist clergy who immediately all pulled out our phones. You can think about that. Also worth thinking about is the inspiration for this app in Bhutan, a country that measures its wealth in gross national happiness, and that is indeed the happiest country in the world. It is said that contemplating death five times a day brings happiness. There's something about contemplating the limit of our time on earth that can be profoundly motivating in the no time to waste, no time like the present, let's get going kind of way. We might just ask where we're going, that would be good. Well, yeah, yeah. We should also be asking what's going to motivate and sustain us on the journey. At one time or another, most of us have almost certainly been encouraged to picture in our mind's eyes something we thought we wanted, the feel of warm white sand between our toes, a cold drink with a little umbrella, and an expanse of Caribbean blue ocean before us a fast car, a beautiful home, the way we'd look walking down the runway or the red carpet or whatever felt lovely but far away at that moment. Alas, there's bad news about visualization. The research is in. Although visualizing our future might make us feel good, the technique is, at best, ineffective. In many, one of many studies, in the time leading up to an important exam, some students were asked to spend just a few minutes each day visualizing getting a high grade and imagining how great that would feel. The control group went about the business as usual, preparing for the exam. Students in both groups noted how many hours they studied each day. As it turns out, the daydreamers studied less and made lower grades. Ugh. In another study, students were directed to fantasize about getting their dream job after college. Two years later, those who had imagined their success had submitted fewer job applications, received a lower number of job offers, and were making significantly smaller salaries than their classmates. Ugh. One more. This one's about one of America's favorite obsessions, losing weight. A group of women taking part in a weight loss program were asked to imagine how they would respond to various scenarios of being tempted with tasty, high-calorie foods. One year later, those who had imagined themselves as resisting and abstaining were compared with those who imagined themselves eating, well, everything in sight. And Those with more positive fantasies had lost on average 26 pounds less than those with negative fantasies. Ugh. I'm sorry to say these studies go on and on and it's not pretty. Visualization seems like it should work, doesn't it? No one seems to know where the problem lies. Maybe it's that 
when we're lost in our daydreams and how fabulous it's going to be, we aren't building the muscles for the inevitable setbacks in achieving our dreams. Or maybe visualization is just escapism, derailing us from putting in the hard work required to get somewhere wonderful. I'm not sure it's all bad. Visualization could certainly make us feel better in the moment. But it's definitely not a way to transform our lives. Now what? British psychologist Richard Wiseman conducted a really interesting long-term study of motivation. More than 5,000 people from around the world signed up to change their lives. At the beginning of the project, almost everyone was confident that they could achieve the goal they set for themselves. The usual suspects, such as losing weight, quitting smoking, embarking on a new career, falling in love, etc. At the end, only 10% was successful. Everyone was asked to describe the techniques they had used. So these are the top 10 responses. One, make a step-by-step -step plan. Two, focus on someone I admire for their achievement, a celebrity or a great leader. Three, tell others about my goal. Four, think about the bad things that will happen if I don't make my goal. Five, think about the good things that will happen if I make my goal. Six, try to suppress unhelpful thoughts, avoid thinking about smoking, overeating, or otherwise failing. Seven, reward myself for progress. Eight, rely on willpower. Nine, record my progress using a journal or a chart. 10, fantasies about how great my life will be when I make that goal. Well, we already know that that one doesn't work. And it actually turns out that only half of these will work. So let's start with the losers. It turns out that aspiring to be like a movie star or a world leader does not make an appreciable difference in achieving that status. If you know anything about addiction and recovery, you know that willpower is grossly overrated. Using thought suppression is a fail, as is daydreaming. All of these are motivational myths. None of them will enable us to take control of our lives. Now to the winners. Here are the top three. First, have a plan. Salesman and motivational speaker Zig Ziglar was famous for saying that we tend not to just wander around and then suddenly find ourselves on top of Mount Everest. Aimlessness is problematic, so the trick is to break down our goal into a series of manageable steps. In 12-step programs, we say one day at a time. We want to touch, torch the fear and hesitation that might be associated with taking on a daunting challenge. The best plans are made of concrete, measurable, scheduled steps. In Richard Wiseman's study, although many participants said they wanted to enjoy life more, the successful ones made a calendar, setting aside time to be with friends two evenings a week, and making plans to travel once a year. Interestingly, Writing it down boosts our chances of success. Second, tell someone, actually tell everyone, when we want to make a change but keep our plans to ourselves, it is just too easy to drift back into old habits. Go public. The more amplified our declaration, the more motivated we are, and people can support us then when the road gets rough. One study proved that having friends by our side makes life seem easier. This is very sweet. People were taken to the bottom of a hill and asked to estimate how steep it was and how hard it would be to climb. When a friend went with them, their estimates were 15% lower than when they were there on their own. In fact, just thinking about a friend as they gazed at the hill made it seem far more surmountable. 
Third, focus on the benefits and think rewards. A reward does not have to be big and it should never conflict with the major goal as in don't eat a whole cake to celebrate a week of healthy eating. But giving ourselves something to look forward to can be inspirational and reinforces what we've already achieved. So let's circle back to visualization because it turns out if deployed effectively, our imagination really is our friend. While daydreaming about success without a plan for how we're going to get there is a non-starter, it turns out that visualizing each step of the way can be very powerful. Getting down to business with a clear roadmap before us and literally imagining ourselves traveling it. In the case of the students who are facing a big exam, those who visualize the process of study, when, where, what, and how, were in the best shape of all. The theory is that it made the workload seem more manageable and reduced test anxiety. This translated to athletes as well. Tennis players and golfers benefited not from imagining themselves winning, but from imagining themselves training. Researcher Gabrielle Ottingen at UPenn has concluded that ideally we are at our best when we can be both optimistic about our goal and at the same time realistic about the hurdles we may need to clear. This is counterintuitive, but the science is in. Dr. Ottingen's seven steps are included in your order of service this morning. If you'd like to take them home and reflect on them, so here's the ideal. First, you think of something you want to achieve. And second, you fantasize about reaching that goal. You note your top two benefits associated with your goal. And third, you think about what's standing in your way. Note your top two roadblocks to success. Fourth, return to the first benefit. How will it make you happier? Fifth, return to the first roadblock. What will you do when you come to it? Sixth, return to the second benefit. How will it make you happier? And seventh, return to the second roadblock. What will you do when you come to it? Circling back to We Croak, many of you very kindly wrote to me after the January 17th death of poet Mary Oliver, as if I, as if all of us had lost a family member. And I would say we have, and I miss her already, though she has left a treasure trove of clear instructions for living a deeply spiritual and exalted life. It was a line of her poetry that inspired the sermon on motivation. She wrote, I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Here's the entire close of that poem. It's called When Death Comes. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. And in closing, my beloved spiritual companions, I'll give you the end of another of Mary Oliver's poems, one you may know by heart, and if you don't, you'll want to. Here's how she finishes the summer day. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I have been doing 
all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Amen. Well, last Sunday, six people and one infant came trudging through the winter storm to be sure to make it to their new member class. What a joy to introduce to you this intrepid and dedicated group of new members. Today they are taking the leap of faith between being guests and joining the home team. It's a great day at Arlington Street when we welcome new members. Each of these spiritual warriors has participated in a membership class, initiating them into the mysteries and majesties of Arlington Street Church and Unitarian Universalism. I want to thank everyone who helped with this new member class. You can stand as I read your name. We just want to love you a little bit. Al Ingram, Carol Fisher, Dar Daniel Rosenzweig, Daryl Waters, Dave Egan, Jen Britt, Lois Hartsoff, Rita Falzerano and Sarah Kulibeck, thank you, my friends. I also want to thank our fabulous membership team lead, Rachel Corey. It takes a village, my friends. It's beautiful. So the new members have also signed two things, the membership book, making them voting members of the corporation, and a covenant card pledging gifts of money and service in return for the opportunity to grow their souls in this beloved community of memory and hope. As I read their names now, each of them is going to light a candle, symbolic of their gifts and of the unique and precious light they bear. Let your light so shine, my friends. Chris Medeiros. And Nathan Brown. and Jeffrey, and Kelsey Speaks, and Baby Aurelia. <laughs> Aurelia, would you like to show everyone your tutu while we have a little pause in the action? <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike McKenzie. As our newest members prepare to join this beloved spiritual community, we ask them, what gifts do you bring? Michael will share the group's responses. Just do a mic check, quick mic check so you can hear me. <coughs> yeah. We are here to join you today in the spiritual community and to add our gifts to yours. We bring protection from danger as, first, as service members and first responders. We bring four decades of GLBTQ activism, including personal direct change to policies at the city, state, and national levels. We bring enthusiasm, a childlike wonder, and a set of funny quirks. We bring a connection to the nonprofit world, experiences in substance abuse, mental health, and homelessness. We bring ourselves, who we are, and who we want to be. We bring love, all forms of spirituality that are rooted in justice and love. We bring a love of people's stories. We bring a love of shared meals, very simple, and very fancy ones. We bring a love of things that bring us to love the vastness of the universe, from NASA pictures to, to, to 
from NASA pictures to cherish Star Trek episodes. We bring a love of theater, a passion for music, and an adorable baby with us. These are the gifts we bring to you. We receive your gifts with thanks and with great joy. In return, we offer you our open minds, our open hearts, and our open hands. We're so glad that your spiritual journey has brought you home to us. Welcome home. These are the words of W.E.B. Du Bois, co-founder of the NAACP, the first African-American to earn a doctorate from Harvard. The prayer of our souls is a petition for persistence. Not for the one good deed or single thought, but deed upon deed and thought upon thought until day calling unto day, we shall make a life worth living. Let us make our lives worth living. Let's keep the faith and pass it on. The spirit, the service begins when the service ends. Bless your hearts. Amen. Please visit ASCBoston.org for more information about this historic Unitarian Universalist congregation. Arlington Street Church, gathered in love and service for justice and peace.